Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I may uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Olaf Könken. I'm the project manager of the Council uh, of Europe Academic uh, Networks, uh, CEAN, that is uh, also a co-organizer of this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to uh, make a few remarks uh, uh, on technicalities regarding this uh, webinar. Um, as uh, Gianluca has already um, uh, mentioned, we would like to ask you uh, to switch off your microphone and your camera. So this is uh, for all those who are not uh, 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 the, uh, uh, presenting in the session. So you can find the symbols for the camera and the microphone uh, in this uh, upper center of your screen. When you move the mouse a little bit, it will appear. So just click on that camera and that microphone and then uh, uh, it will be uh, muted and that will uh, tremendously improve uh, uh, the sound uh, quality. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, we will, um, of course, have a question and uh, answer session after the presentations. Uh, you can um, basically uh, submit your questions at uh, any time um, uh, through the chat function. The chat function is uh, uh, on, the, on the right side um, of your screen. There's a little uh, box uh, that says uh, chat, and then underneath you can uh, type your message. Um, before you type your message, uh, please always uh, state your name and uh, the institution you are working for or your function, so we know uh, who is asking uh, uh, the questions. It would be good, of course, to keep the questions uh, clear and uh, precise for the sake of the uh, discussion. And uh, the moderator then uh, later will uh, read out these questions and um, um, uh, assign them to somebody to answer them. Um, we are uh, conducting this whole uh, webinar through a tool that's called uh, uh, Blue Jeans. Uh, Blue Jeans uh, does unfortunately not allow for interpretation, so the entire webinar will be uh, conducted in English. But of course, uh, if you uh, feel uh, uh, like you would like to submit your question in French, uh, that is also uh, 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 possible. Uh, so you can type your question in French, and uh, but the discussion uh, will be in English. Um, the the whole discussion and the whole webinar will be recorded. Uh, I think you can all see a, a blinking uh, a red dot in the upper left corner of your screen. That means uh, that the recording uh, uh, is on. So um, um, I th what I can see, uh, all speakers uh, have their cameras uh, adjusted. So um, uh, it's always important uh, to be uh, uh, in, in focus. So we have a good uh, uh, recording uh, quality uh, for the video uh, that will be then later uh, uh, put at your disposal on the Greco uh, website. So that would be all from my side, and uh, I give back to Gianluca. Thank you very much, uh, Olaf. Good morning, uh, everyone. I'm very happy to see uh, many of you uh, connected online for uh, this first webinar that Greco is organizing uh, on the topic of the uh, uh, prevention of corruption risks in the context of the uh, pandemic. Uh, I want to welcome uh, all the different participants. The participants come from uh, the academia, uh, members of uh, national delegations in Greco. Uh, we have uh, uh, members of uh, the media uh, attending uh, and national experts. So I'm very happy to see a, a multitude of uh, uh, diverse experts participating in this, uh, in this particular event. Um, the way we are going to run it is, as Olaf indicated, uh, it would be good if you had any question uh, during uh, or after the different interventions, if you can post it on the chat, uh, I will then read it out and direct it to the uh, uh, presenters. Uh, so without further, uh, further ado, let me start by uh, welcoming the, the speakers, uh, Professor Nicoletti, uh, the former president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, and currently the person responsible for the Council of Europe Academic Network. Uh, we uh, also have uh, the president of Greco, uh, Mr. Marin Bercela, is also the vice president of the uh, uh, Supreme Court of uh, Croatia. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Professor Paola Severino, uh, the former Italian Minister of Justice, 
who is currently the vice president of Luis uh, Carli University and the special representative of the OSC chairman uh, in office on combating corruption. Uh, I'm very glad to see all of you here, and I will start by giving the floor to uh, Professor Nicoletti. Good morning uh, and welcome uh, everybody. Thank you uh, to the organizer of this uh, seminar and thank you to the speakers. I'm Michele Nicoletti and I'm a professor uh, of political philosophy at the University of Trento and uh, actually coordinator of the feasibility study for the establishment of an academic uh, network uh, of the Council uh, of Europe. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, one of the first initiative uh, of our academic network uh, is uh, this uh, seminar that we have organized uh, with Greco. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Greco president, uh, Marin Mercella, and uh, Gianluca Esposito for having accepted this. Uh, uh, idea and uh, for having uh, organized a seminar. Uh, one of the, of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, as rapporteur and then as president, I had the opportunity to, uh, to see how important is the cooperation that Greco offers to all the member states of the Council of Europe. Uh, as an Italian, uh, I have to say that the Greco support was uh, absolutely important uh, in order to improve our legislation and uh, to adopt uh, some important tools at parliamentary level. I would like to mention the code of conduct, uh, but also for the creation of uh, an anti-corruption uh, authority, uh, which at that time was Cantone and uh, uh, is now represented here also by the Vice, Vice President, uh, Professor Parisi. Uh, this uh, is to say that uh, this cooperation between uh, member states and international organization if, uh, is absolutely important and this uh, cooperation has to be enriched uh, by a strong connection with the academic uh, world, uh, which can offer uh, scholars, uh, which can offer uh, young researchers, which, which can offer a lot of people uh, who are really committed to the values and the principle of the Council of Europe uh, that has human rights, uh, democracy and uh, the rule of law. Uh, the Greco has, uh, you know, has uh, issued the the Greco guidelines on management 19. And uh, I really appreciated uh, the big effort that the Greco has done. And uh, I would like to express my gratitude for these guidelines, uh, which are very useful. Uh, in the situation of my country, I would like to mention Italy again. Uh, we are facing a big uh, economic crisis uh, after after the, the big, uh, pandemic crisis that we have uh, experienced in uh, February and March and April. Uh, and this uh, economic crisis a big uh, opportunity also for criminal organizations and for the mafia to to influence uh, our economic and social and civil life. Uh, so. Uh, this, uh, these guidelines are really very important uh, for us, uh, and the big challenge uh, will be to find a right balance between the fight against corruption and uh, and the support to our uh, social economic crisis. And this, I think, that it is a challenge not also for my country but for many other countries. And I would like now to welcome uh, Professor Severino. It is a, a big pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to have her here. Uh, as you know, Professor Severino is Vice President of the Louis University. Louis University is one of the universities in Italy uh, which are uh, strongly committed in fighting against corruption. They have organized uh, several 
uh, seminars, conferences, and uh, also to a master call to, to the training of professionals uh, uh, committed in, in, in the fighting against uh, corruption. And uh, Professor Paola Severino was uh, Minister of Justice uh, in the cabinet led by, by Mario Monti. And uh, uh, in her capacity in 2012, uh, she presented to the Italian Parliament uh, the law uh, regarding provisions for prevention and repression of corruption, which is a really a milestone in the history of fighting uh, corruption uh, in Italy. So I'm very pleased and honored that uh, she has accepted our invitation and uh, she is here. And then I would like to welcome all the other participants, uh, uh, colleagues from universities and uh, academic research centers, uh, representative of uh, uh, different institutions, the Council of Europe, uh, anti corruption institutions, and especially uh, representative of two important uh, networks. Uh, uh, involved in the fight against corruption, that is the Interdisciplinary Corruption Research Network and uh, the Corvis, uh, uh, whose representative uh, had uh, uh, already had to meet uh, your counting about uh, cooperation. Uh, we really think that uh, it is important uh, to uh, create uh, the maximum of cooperation among existing networks, uh, especially involving uh, young scholars, PhD students, uh, all the experts uh, that can give uh, us uh, an important contribution in this, uh, which is not only uh, uh, an important uh, battle uh, for uh, a higher ethical level of our, of our society, but also for the respect of democracy and uh, human rights. Um, so thanks uh, to all of you, and I wish all the participants uh, a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Nicoletti. Uh, and uh, let me uh, let me now give the floor uh, straight away to uh, uh, and uh, Mario Mircella, the president of Greco, uh, to uh, provide his uh, presentation that relates specifically to the uh, uh, document that he issued about the uh, mitigating uh, measures in relation to the corruption. Uh, thank you, Gianluca. Do, do you hear me? Is everything okay? Okay. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank you, Professor Nicoletti, uh, for your kind words in the beginning. Uh, I would like also to say that I'm very happy to be with you today. It's a completely new experience. We are used to sitting in the one room, but now we are sitting in our studies rooms or wherever, and uh, the, the virus brings a lot of changes. This is one of them. Uh, this virtual sharing of my of the guidance that the Greco issue, I think it's uh, very, uh, it could be very useful and it should be very useful. Uh, and we do that because we are we felt that we have experience and the 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 praxis to do that as you know the core function of greco is monitoring and our job is to monitor compliance uh, with the effective implementation of our anti-corruption standards by 50 member states and we are not doing only the implementation but we are sometimes interpreting the standards and those guidelines that, they is that we issued, that the Greco issued, is exactly part of that. Also, this is the interpretation of the standards or how they should be implemented in the practice. So our job of the implementation is, uh, we are doing that through the process of mutual evaluation and the peer pressure, which some people consider intrusive and tough, but think the anti-corruption fight is not an easy one. And to some extent it is. It is intrusive, but 
all the people who are in all 50 countries agree to do that. It is also legal, it is professional, it is technical, and it is not political. However, since politics is in every aspect of our life, I think that uh, we, our recommendations and our work cannot be effective without political will. And that's why is that very important. Our function, Greco's function, is basically preventive. So we want countries to take measures to stop corruption before it comes. It's a famous you know, physician uh, saying it's better to prevent than to cure. Uh, this is why you will find the world prevention in our title of the topics of our last two evaluation rounds. So this is the, the important stuff that I would like to say. Uh, and that was precisely this preventive function in mind that I took the initiative to issue the gu these guidelines on managing corruption in the context of COVID-19. It was, and still, it is my intention to raise the flag, an orange flag for the moment, that the tragic situation for all countries has an additional dark side which may last well after the pandemic has have been defeated, which I will hope happens soon. This dark side is the risk of corruption infiltrating at various points. The guidance doesn't come from the sky, it doesn't fall from you know just like that. It was triggered by information we have gathered from public and non-public persons and institutions. It is also, also largely based on the Greco evaluation experience and our anti-corruption standards. The key words, there are three of the key words that I think it's very important to, to, to remember, and that is transparency, the second one is oversight, and the third one is accountability. So you have read the guidance, probably, but I will not go to read it again because it's uh, basically I will touch them uh, from the three points that I would like to mention. The first one is the guidance are related to the area of the public procurement. As Professor Nicoletti said, the COVID, the virus affects the economy very much. And of course, every country, including our 50 countries in the Greco, needs to buy medical supplies and the masks and the, and the gloves and, the, uh, and everything, where, you know, respirators, which are apparently very expensive, and all the other medical issues. So this is without any question a risk area about the public procurement. And of course, every country have or should have rules about the public procurement. But it is clear when confronted with a such emergency, such as fight against virus, countries need to speed up or simplify the procurement process. However, if this occurs, it should be not done to determine of the necessary protection against corruption. So I'm not advocating bending the rules or avoiding the rules, but find the proper balance where the key word is transparency. So let me say that the transparency in the public sector is one of the most important means for preventing corruption, whatever form it takes. If everything is transparent, then of course it's uh, very hard to, to do something which is not by the rules or something illegal. But the need for a regular and reliable information from public institutions is crucial in this time of emergency. This concerns the spread and risks of the pandemic as such, but also emergency measures taken in response to them. We should not allow that virus compromise our values and our standards, including transparency and accountability. Digital information platforms, such as dedicated transparency portals, are available corruption prevention tools 
and instrumental to protect the rule of law. So I think that every government or every institution that is included in the public procurement and that is trying to find and to buy medical supplies and everything else should do it transparent. And of course, today, it could be easier through the, this digital and internet uh, means. The second thing that I would like to stress out uh, relates to the management of conflict of interest and lobbying. These are not new areas for the Greco. We have developed um, abundant jurisprudence in these areas in relation to all the powers of the state, all the three powers, legislative, judiciary, and executive. Many countries and private companies are heavily investing in research and development of drugs and vaccination against COVID-19. And huge amounts of money are being invested in researches and development. This is, of course, how it should be. And we are, of course, looking forward to see the results and to have a vaccine as soon as possible. But however, when doing so, the conflict of interest, notably with respect to persons entrusted with the top executive functions, should be managed, including through responsive advisory, monitoring, and compliance mechanisms. In addition, lobbying needs to be properly regulated and guided by Committee of Minister Recommendation R 2072 on the legal regulating of lobbying activities in the context of public decision making and the extensive volume of Greco recommendation in this area. The third and final point that I would like to uh, raise is the whistleblower protection. Of course, you understand why the whistleblower are important and why there is a need to protect them. They can be key in the fight against corruption and tackling gross mismanagement in the public and private sectors, including the health sectors. The Council of Europe recognizes the value of whistleblowing in deterring and preventing wrongdoing and in strengthening the democratic accountability and transparency. And of course, the states should be guided by the Committee of Ministers' recommendation on the protection of whistleblowers, as well as many Greco recommendations in this area, in order to create a favorable environment for whistleblowers, whistleblowers in, in these critical times. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. Uh, I don't want to speak too much, although I might already, but I hope that there will be time for the, for the questions. Uh, I could give you countless examples of cases in which Greco anticipated situation that regrettably materialized a few years later in our member state. I hope that in this case, no one would be able to say that he or she was not warned in advance. That's why we issued the guidance. Let's not add another tragedy, corruption related, to the already existing one. I trust the governments in our member states will take the guidance seriously and implement in their respective processes and procedures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mercela. Uh, thank you for your comprehensive presentation and for having shared with the uh, audience this uh, guidance that uh, issued on uh, uh, you know, the measures uh, that we have recommended to countries to mitigate the risks of corruption. And I just wanted to highlight the three points that, that you made in relation to public procurement, in relation to uh, um, uh, the management of conflict of interest and lobbying, and finally the issue of whistleblowing. Uh, there are, of course, others that are highlighted in the paper, uh, but uh, it was right to focus on uh, on these three issues. Let me uh, uh, give the floor to Professor Severino right now. Before I do that, I just uh, uh, invite also the audience uh, to uh, think about the questions or interventions they would like to make uh, after the uh, statement by uh, Professor Severino, because I will open the floor after that, and we'll have a, a good amount of time for questions and answers and debates, which I think is the uh, interesting part as well of uh, such an event. Professor Severino, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends. Uh, it is a great, great, great pleasure to address uh, this audience today. 
and uh, a special thanks to Professor Nicoletti for the uh, wonderful presentation uh, you made about me. Um, at a time uh, of crisis, uh, as the one we are all going through, uh, we all can see more clearly the importance of international cooperation as the most effective way to react to global threats. Therefore, uh, I strongly believe that uh, multilateral organizations like Greco, and thank you for your guidelines, are very clear, very easy to be read, and uh, I hope uh, very, very easy to be applied. And this is excellent from my point of view. Um, I was saying multilateral organizations like Greco, uh, like the Council of Europe, uh, like the OEC and the OECD, and uh, uh, as you know, I, I was appointed by OEC uh, and entrusted for the third uh, consecutive year with the mandate of special representative for the fight uh, against corruption. I strongly think that multilateral uh, organizations can provide a sound platform for supporting joint measures to tackle the dramatic uh, impact uh, of this pandemic uh, in uh, our regions. And I strongly believe that the suggestions elaborated by Greco on the medical and health services are very important for a common strategy against corruption, bribery and fraud in this sector. The current crisis due to the COVID pandemic uh, has uh, required governments, including Italy as the first European country severely hit by the crisis, to take extraordinary measures and uh, has impacted all sectors of society and economy, from public health to environment, social and governance systems. The need to address with the utmost sense of urgency the challenges put by the pandemic has been exerting a huge pressure to quick and efficient responses for in terms of a provision of services and public spending and obviously generated the new appetites for corruption and fraud crimes in this scenario i would like to try and balance any grim scenario of demise with the call to take up instead the opportunity offered by the crisis to expedite the modernization of our public governance systems alongside a strong reaffirmation of their main pillars and tenets. I strongly believe and I totally agree with the Greco president on the importance of prevention. Uh, now in Italy, our law is based on prevention, which is uh, very important, perhaps uh, more important than sanction, because if you are able to prevent, you will obtain an, ad a, an incredible advantage, avoiding the crimes. And more clearly speaking about uh, uh, one of the aspects uh, uh, of the prevention, I strongly believe that the same sense of urgency that the governments are applying to meet the demand of goods and services in times of crisis should provide agency to the objective of a new social contract built on trust, on trust, on transparency, uh, a new social contract based on uh, liability, uh, self-liability, of, of people, one where the private citizens and the business communities be called to act as responsible stakeholders, ready to take on the responsibility of being an active part in the enforcement of the principles of transparency and accountability. Indeed, I am referring to the need of leveraging on the severe constraints posed by the crisis to apply and extend measures of simplification of rules and procedures that appear in Italy, but I think uh, all over uh, Europe uh, and perhaps all over the world, excessive, rigid or redundant in this crisis. In, um, 
uh, a renewed effort to foster collective responsibility between citizens and government and a culture of integrity. I strongly think that culture is one of the key pillars for the fight against corruption. Efforts in pursuing this new social compact for good public governance do require also a renewed commitment to go further in the digital transformation of companies and governments, such as e-government tools, automation of internal processes, and digital public services, getting an ID paying taxes. Over the last few years, and particularly within my mandate in the OEC, I have promoted a, a serious discussion on the multifaced nature of te technology as a source both of challenges and opportunities. And a new episode uh, uh, about cyber attacks and cyber opportunities show the black and the white side of technology. Indeed, digital tools and ICT uh, can be used to foster democratic processes and increase transparency and the citizens' political engagement while anchoring integrity in the public sector. If there is uh, one certainly emerging from the uh, heads of the fight against COVID is the urgent need to accelerate the digital transformation of our public governance systems. We should not miss this opportunity. Our joint efforts have provided us with sound governance system. systems. Uh, now we have to spare no efforts in order to further enhance those systems through how inclusive engagement ICT innovation and a new call for international and multilateral cooperation. And it seems to me that the, answer, give, the answers given by Greco are uh, an example for all of us. The stakes are too high to refrain from such a commitment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Severino, and thank you really for uh, having walked us through uh, uh, the importance of multilateralism uh, and the impact that uh, multilateral cooperation has on national development. Um, I'm also glad that you uh, referred to the uh, crisis as an opportunity uh, to improve uh, governance uh, and uh, modernizing our government, uh, and also to the issue of uh, corruption prevention that, as you know, is, is very dear to us in Greco. Um, I'm also glad that you referred to the uh, uh, use of ICTs, uh, information and communication technologies, uh, as a great opportunity to improve the situation, but also uh, to be managed with care to avoid risks. Uh, I like to say that we have to be careful to avoid moving from uh, what we are uh, calling political corruption to a situation of tech corruption, where we are actually going to uh, find ourselves having to deal with uh, preventive measures that relate to the tech companies and not the political world. Um, well, with that, let me uh, open the floor to uh, to the audience now. We have uh, a, a good uh, you know, 40, 50 minutes uh, for an exchange of views, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I think that makes the, uh, the event uh, interesting and dynamic. Uh, so the, the floor is open, the chat is open. Um, as uh, my colleague Olaf indicated before, because we have a relatively large number of participants uh, in, the, in the event, we have to be a little bit regulated in the way we, we manage this. So, uh, if I could uh, ask those who want to ask questions to uh, either ask for the floor in the chat and ideally ask the question in the chat, or uh, to uh, uh, to uh, somehow express intention to say something. Uh, I have one question from uh, one of my colleagues from uh, the Council of Europe. Uh, and I will read it out uh, as well uh, so that other colleagues may start thinking about their own questions. Uh, so Olaf, uh, in fact, asked uh, himself a question, uh, and it's good that he is uh, breaking the ice in asking the question. Um, so the sums, Olaf is, is asking, the sums spent on saving uh, national economies are tremendous. Lots of money spent into that, and probably bigger than on public procurement. How do you evaluate the danger 
of fraud based on the recent experience. What can be done to mitigate uh, the risk of corruption, uh, if I can interpret the question, in relation to all this money that is flowing into the economies uh, in order to, to save them? Um, I don't know if uh, I, I leave the three speakers free to choose who wants to speak first. I can see them on the screen, so you can raise your hand uh, if you want to reply to that question. Um, either Professor Nicoletti or uh, Professor Severino or President Mercella. Anyone of you who wants to say what are the measures you suggest uh, should be taken or what care should be taken to mitigate the risks uh, of corruption and fraud with all the money that is flowing into the economic system. So I'll give the floor to the speakers, whoever wants to speak first. Yes, uh, Mr. Mischela, you have the floor. Thank you, Gianluca. Well, uh, I spoke, I wrote about uh, prevention of the fraud in the uh, in the fight uh, against the virus and to following the standards that already exist. And as you know, there is a, a we have an Interpol and we have Financial Action Task Force and uh, some national agency uh, or bodies that have already issued warning concerning financial scams that can be on the, on the internet and on these issues with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of money that is uh, pouring into the into the countries or into the health sector and that is supposed to be used for the uh, for the uh, research and development but also for the procurement and of course i would like to mention that there is a council of europe uh, medic crime convention uh, which requires states to criminalize a number of things but also the the uh, all the stuff that is necessary for fighting against counterfeiting of the of the uh, medical products. So I think if we are following the rules that are already here, that we already have, is I think it's a good way to to prevent that. Of course, the repression is necessary, but the repression is necessary when the crime already occurs. But the prevention, as uh, Professor Severino and, and, and Professor Nicoletti said already, is really the, 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 I would say, the most important one. And that's why there is a need for, and I know that I'm repeating myself, about the transparency. But also when we are talking about this, we need to have in mind that all the money that is pouring into the health sector will be used. And it is need for us, for the citizens, to see how it is used. And especially, which I didn't mention before, is, and this is also something that is related to the fraud, is a private sector, which is often used in order to obtain the medical supplies and in order to, to, to fight the virus. So in this private sector, you know, there are of course legal entities because private citizens are owing legal entities and we have to do everything what is in our power. I mean, the government uh, through the transparency so that the, those legal entities should not be used as the shield for the corruption or the shield for earning improper money in all uh, procurement and or supplying of that. So I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, I think that uh, we tackled or touched, excuse me, we touched the fraud issue in the guidance that we that we already issued. And that's why I think it's important to follow the not only the guidance, of course, but the 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 existing conventions that are already in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mercela. Anybody else who wants to address this particular point? 
If not, I will uh, pass the, uh, to the next uh, question and comment. Uh, short, this short. Severino, uh, go ahead. Yes, for a short, short answer. Uh, I think that the economic crisis will be an accelerator for the commission of crimes um, linked to the uh, illegal use of economy, uh, like fraud and uh, bribery. They, I think that they will multiply. Um, but I also think that uh, transparency and digitalization will help us in preventing this kind of crimes. If, for example, we uh, decide to have rules on the, uh, on the uh, necessity to um, digitalize the uh, context uh, or the contents of public contracts, this will increase transparency and will avoid that lobbyists could um, uh, illegally use their position to obtain uh, public contracts. This is an example, and uh, I totally agree with the president uh, about the importance of transparency in preventing this kind of crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Severino. Absolutely, transparency is a, a key word in addressing this uh, challenge. Uh, so I have a, a second question, a second intervention from uh, Professor Parisi from the uh, Italian delegation in Greco and Vice President of the Italian National Anti-Corruption uh, Authority. Um, Professor Parisi, can I suggest that you uh, uh, come on, uh, I understand you, you want to say something orally, so let's see whether this works. If you can put on, for the time that you speak, both your microphone and your video, and then if you can switch off both of them after that, so I can give the floor to the other uh, speakers. So, uh, Professor Parisi, you have the floor. Thank, thanks so much. Um, um, speaking as a board member of the Italian Anti-Corruption Authority, I consider transparency, as said from Paola Severino, a central issue as well highlighted by Greco President in the, his guidelines. Transparency in Italy, for example, has decreased in this period, if only because the public authorities have difficulties in implementing bureaucratic obligation. For example, FOIA law has been stopped in Italy in this period, so citizens has, has, have no uh, way for uh, have information. Transparency needs to be supported with other systems. ANAC is trying on the one hand by enhancing digitalization of public procurement, on the other hand by supporting whistleblowers. Secondly, in my capacity as co-vice president of the International Network of Corruption Prevention Authority, Authorities, I supported these two needs in the message published on the website of the NCPA. Besides simplified fast-track procedure for public and private procurement through the use of preliminary affidavits paired with clause of reinforced accountability and ex post auditing. So transparency is in the co at the core of the problem. The risk that the public resources are used in a seriously distorted way and that citizens have equally distorted information is really very serious. And let me close my little speech with a thank, a very um, warm thank to uh, the president of Greco and uh, uh, Nicoletti and Gianluca for the supporting of our project um, born in the uh, assembly of the Council of Europe for initiative of President Raffaele Cantone. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Parisi. So if you can uh, switch off your, your microphone and your video now, don't go away, just switch off your video and your microphone so that we can uh, uh, have the, uh, the speakers on, uh, on the screen. Um, I will. I have another question from uh, the Council of Europe uh, office in Tirana. Uh, our colleague uh, Liliana Arcacci. She is asking. Uh, I'm going to read the question and try to steer it a bit. The emergency situation has been 
has been prolonged until June. Yet, it could be prolonged again by the government, increasing corruption risks, especially in procurement with the fast procedures. How to mitigate? In other words, the question is really, uh, when it comes to public procurement, um, when governments have uh, extend the uh, emergency uh, situation in their own countries, uh, they, of course, then have to go through public procurement procedures uh, that would be faster. Um, of course, that creates risks. Is there anything that we can say about how to mitigate the risks there? Uh, yes, uh, Prof. yes, uh, President uh, Mircea. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, we should repeat the, about the transparency. But the transparency is, let's say, a principle. A general term. So, how to accomplish, how to have a transparency? I understand that in the state of the emergency, the you can't have a full public procurement procedure, which sometimes is two, three, four, six months. You need to buy it again, immediately. So, uh, one of the things is that you publish that on the website. First of all, you have a formal procedure and the formal decisions that the public procurement will be suspended or will be modified in the in the certain terms. And then you have the the uh, not only the use of the internet in order to make it public, but also use the media. I know that in many countries you have everyday media conference about what is happening. And not only regarding the health sector, but also regarding the donations. And uh, we received 81 ton of donation from the China or wherever else. So there is a need to uh, use the media to, uh, to, to spread this message and to the spread transparency of everything that large. That is uh, that is coming to the country and that is used in the in the in the fight against virus. So I think this is a, one of the tools. So we have an internet and we have a media and then of course we have a, a social networks, which you know we know that a, a lot of government is are using the social networks and the Facebook and the prime ministers they have a Twitter account and everything like that. And the president of the United States have a Twitter account, which is also some, sometimes very interesting. But this is a something, these are all the tools that we can use in order to have a transparency. And of course, if we are using that, if the country says, okay, we are receiving a medical equipment worth, worth, I don't know, 3 million euros, and we will dispense it through the countries like this, in this hospital, in that hospital, and that, that is good for the transparency and that is good for fighting corruption. If we have received money from the, let's say, uh, fund from the European Union, we received that amount and we will spend it like this and we will buy this. And of course, if the government is not buying directly from someone, so if it, it is a purchase, then it must be seen who is the purchasing. And in order to that, we should avoid that the, as I said, the legal entities is used as the, you know, uh, shield for any misconduct. So if the country is buying something, it should be from the legal entity that is not connected to the government, where the where the the the, the director is not the second cousin of the minister of the health. You know, this is a something that we uh, that that we have to keep in mind, and that's why the transparency is important. So we have to make transparent almost everything, almost everything. You know, you, you don't have to make a public records when the Minister of Health or any other uh, sector of Prime Minister is talking about the other Prime Minister, what will they will do regarding donations or whatever. But the outcome must be transparent and the way how uh, it, it, uh, it goes. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Yes, Professor Severino. And then, uh, uh, so that you know, I have uh, two two additional questions uh, that are waiting on the chat, which I'm going to take uh, immediately after. One from Oscar Roca uh, from uh, Catalonia, and another one from James Thomas, who is a reporter at Global Investigations Review. Uh, but uh, Professor Severino first, and then I'll take the two questions I have uh, on the chat. Very, very shortly. Uh, I think that uh, transparency is fundamental, as said by the President. Uh, but we have also to add, uh, because we are speaking about political and uh, governmental side, that uh, also the regulation of lobbying is very important. In the Greco guidelines, we find a very, very important indication on that. Greco recommends ensuring that all contacts of persons entrusted with the top executive functions, with lobbyists and other third parties who seek to influence government decision making uh, are duly reported, including contacts with the legal and authorized representatives of companies and interest groups and made public. This is um, a, 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 a translation of transparency on this uh, specific side. And I think also that the organization, organizational models uh, of, uh, um, of legal entities have to be implemented on this side. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Severino and to both of you, because you, you really highlighted uh, two aspects that I think are very important in our debate. One is the role of media, uh, and the second one is the issue of lobbying, uh, which is one where Greco has been very strong uh, in its recommendations to member states. And I must say it's an area where we still need to see progress uh, across uh, all our 50 member states. Yes, uh, Professor Nicoletti, go ahead. I, I would just like to add one thing because I totally agree with what uh, Professor Severino, President Nassella said about the importance of transparency. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to make a link uh, with what Professor Severino said uh, related to the importance of the institutional system because in, 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 in time of emergence, the, there is uh, the risk uh, that some uh, uh, monitoring tools uh, also at institutional level uh, become uh, weaker. For example, the role of parliament uh, uh, before the role of judiciary powers uh, in some countries or the role of anti-corruption authorities and so on. So it is absolutely important to stress uh, the role of internet, uh, of the media, civil society, and, and so on. But on the other side, we need to stress the importance of uh, the role of uh, parliaments, uh, of the independent judiciary, and uh, and so on. Uh, in case, uh, because we, we, we already see some uh, uh, abuses of the so-called state of emergency in some countries, and there is a concrete risk of in, at this uh, level. So what uh, Professor Severino said about the idea of a new social contract is important. Uh, we do not want uh, a new paternalistic approach uh, between the government and the citizens. So what we need is a real new social um, contract in which uh, the citizens, uh, citizens uh, are the real uh, sovereign of the Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Nicoletti, for uh, reminding us that, that we do have control uh, systems in place uh, with parliaments and judiciary. We should uh, certainly uh, make sure that they remain uh, they remain uh, the key pillars of our societies. Uh, and this very nicely links to the question that has been raised by Oscar Roca from uh, uh, the Anti-Fraud Office of Catalonia. I'm going to read out the question. And then I leave the three speakers free to choose who wants to take it um, in the usual way. So the question is, how convenient would it be that internal and external control bodies coordinate in order to carry out a monitoring in real time? Under which formula? Uh, I, this, I suspect, relates to some of the issues that Professor Nicoletti raised when it comes to uh, control by uh, democratic bodies, uh, parliaments. 
controls by the judiciary, but also controls by anti-corruption authorities, uh, I suppose, uh, and anti-fraud bodies, uh, and the importance of the monitoring that is carry, carried out in real time. Um, is there any one of you three who would like to take the question? No? Anybody? Anybody from, uh, I know that we have at least two representatives of the uh, Italian, oh yes, uh, President uh, Mircella, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, uh, this is uh, how you will uh, uh, manage to have uh, cooperation between the, I would say, official control mechanism, it depends on the political will. Of course, it will be very important if you have the, you know, the, the governmental and the institutional oversight bodies or the, the preventive bodies that are, that are using them. But I would like also to add some other thing, and that is non-governmental organization, because they are uh, sometimes very useful and sometimes very forceful in order to to gain the the information from the public from the from the government. So I think that it is important, of course, to find the the proper balance in that, having in mind that all not all information should be public, of course, but uh, also having in mind the need for the citizens to know where the money is going and what is uh, what is happening. Uh, so I think this cooperation should be very, very useful. And uh, I think that proper balance could be fine. And Gianluca, if you would allow me now, I think I have a one question that is related directly to me, and that is uh, regarding the, the whistleblowers protection. What does it mean when we said that there is a favorable environment for whistleblowers in a such critical times? I think the, this, this is exactly the environment that uh, where the rules are set up for whistleblowing and when are rules for protection of whistleblowing so that the whistleblowers know that they will not be repraised or they will not be punished for whistleblowing. So, of course, there are different times of the different ways how you will uh, how you will have a regulation of whistleblowers. You can have the obligations to have first uh, uh, internal reporting, but in any case, you have you need to have a possibility that you go outside uh, without possibility to to. Uh, without the obligation to report inside, especially if you have a small private entity. But if you have a large company, then of course there is a way how to you will do it. But in any case, the protection is necessary and there are other two steps. Everyone should know about those rules. So there is a need even for the education in that, in that respect so that the you know the people cannot say we didn't know about that and there is of course the role of the media and again we are speaking about media here because we know that in many cases whistleblowers are going directly to the media because they don't have a trust and in some cases this is justified so if i may answer that question very short you need to build the the atmosphere where the whistleblowers who are reporting uh, who are reporting a wrongdoing in a good faith this is important in a good faith will be and will will feel protected and I think this is important thank you John Luca Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mircella, and indeed the chat is uh, warming up. Uh, I can see that the virtual events are not very different from real events when it comes to, uh, you know, having a little bit of time needed for uh, people to start uh, speaking. And indeed, I have a number of questions on the chat. Uh, just to add my two cents to uh, James Thomas' question about whistleblowers uh, and to say directly that the answer is yes. 
uh, we, we in the Council of Europe recommend that standards about whistleblowing applies both to the public and private entities uh, at the same time. Uh, Mr. Clementucci from the Italian uh, Anti-Corruption Agency uh, has the following comment slash question, which I'm going to read out. Um, it's a little bit long, so bear with me. Concerning the commercial use of vaccine, once it's found, hopefully, somebody is already suggesting to have a commitment or an agreement signed in advance, that is before the vaccine is found, by major pharmaceutical companies, medical search centers, as well as state institutions, heads of states or ministers of health, to have the vaccine available for the good of all global community with no or minimal um, pursuit of profit. This may lower the chance of abusive use, of fraud and of corruption. Do you think this is possible, realistic and useful option to prevent corruption? Who wants to answer that question? The question is, do you think that having an agreement whereby uh, these vaccines will be produced at basically no profit, will uh, straight away eliminate corruption opportunities and fraud. I have my own views about that, but I, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me see if one of the three speakers would like to say something on that. You can raise your hand if you want to say something. My two cents would be, just in case if nobody wants to say, is that uh, the the profit is not just when it comes to the uh, sale of the vaccine itself, uh, but the risk of corruption, as we have tried to explain, actually arise every single step of the way. Um, Professor Severino referred before to the uh, lobbying issue. Uh, that occurs not only when the vaccine is found, but also in the process of uh, and different steps. And so these corruption opportunities do not just come at the end of the process, but also in between, in the process it itself. And that's where the risks are high, and that's where we have to provide mitigating strategies. If there is no profit at the end, uh, uh, or whether there is profit or not, I, I'm not a specialist of uh, medical supplies, so I'm not going to venture there. But, but certainly, uh, the corruption opportunities arise throughout the process, not just at the end of the process. Uh, that would be my comment on this. But anybody else who wants to comment on this point? Okay. If not, let me go to the next question uh, that comes from. Uh, uh, yeah, let me take the uh, let me take the media first, and then I will take uh, Lara Baena from the uh, Anti Fraud Office of Catalonia in Spain. Um, so Samantha Gro from ANSA, that is the Italian National News Agency. The question that she's asking is this: Has this emergency highlighted specific weaknesses in the anti-corruption systems? The question is reverse. Uh, have we seen some weaknesses that we're, we're not aware of before and that have been highlighted by the pandemic? And uh, then the second question she is asking from ANSA, given the enormous number of public procurement and measures to help the economy, do states have enough resources to control all this to make sure that there are no wrongdoings? So the first question is about do we see weaknesses, specific weaknesses, in the anti-corruption system as a result of the pandemic, first question. And second, um, do countries, do we think the countries have the resources to control uh, all these uh, uh, huge number of public procurement uh, processes that are being held in order to acquire supplies? Who would like to answer the questions from ANSA? One of the two Italian speakers, perhaps, given that the, <laughs> the ANSA is Italian the agency. Uh, Professor Severino, yes, go ahead. Well, I think that uh, it is too early to uh, uh, to, to, to answer okay. to this question. Uh, we, we we have not uh, the possibility, the capacity to have a good monitoring system uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, COVID emergency uh, was born uh, yesterday. Uh, we uh, the timing for the uh, juridical aspect uh, is different from the timing for other people. Uh, we need more time to analyze this aspect. It seems to me that uh, analyzing the European uh, level, uh, something says that uh, the uh, lobbyism uh, aspect has to be uh, better checked. 
because the uh, most uh, relevant uh, case we had, for example, in Italy, uh, shows that the improvement of the anti-lobbying uh, rules uh, um, is very important. Um, as to the um, capacity of our public uh, entities to, um, to monitor, uh, to check, I think that, uh, first of all, ANAC and uh, our uh, magistrates uh, are very expert in preventing corruption. Uh, when I go through the, all over the world, I do not know if it will be possible in the future, but I had a lot of of, uh, of missions, international missions uh, all over the world, um, uh, all people analyze uh, the uh, ANAC uh, model and uh, many, in many countries they are considered as a good example of uh, uh, monitoring capacity and preventing capacity. Um, and uh, uh, because in Italy uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, corruption cases. We have uh, also an experience, uh, a very high level experience in fighting corruption. So if we stress this aspect, we know that our investigators, our uh, tax police, our financial police uh, uh, has a lot of experience uh, in preventing corruption. Uh, so I think that these uh, two um, monitoring uh, powers are very, very uh, good for the job they have to do. As to the um, public uh, components, as to the uh, public employees, uh, as to the public uh, um, uh, high level uh, employees, uh, I, I think that the improvement of uh, the number of these people is uh, totally useless. We need expert people. We do not need more people. We need more expert people. So the uh, job that uh, our universities, for example, are doing in uh, uh, organizing new professionals on this aspect, new professionals ab able to use digital uh, expertise uh, also to better fight uh, corruption, to better prevent uh, corruption, is one of the most important uh, uh, pillars uh, we have to, uh, uh, to, to increase, to improve. Uh, I think that based on these uh, uh, issues, so we could be able to improve our capacity, but uh, that quality is more important than quantity of people. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Severino. And uh, yes, I give the floor to Professor Nicoletti. I just want to remind uh, all of us that we have uh, uh, at least three or four additional questions on the chat and that I'd like to take before we close. Uh, uh, Professor Nicoletti, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to say that uh, well, from my point of view, the kind of instruments uh, that we are functioning in terms of fighting corruption. Uh, looking at the case of Italy, for example, we have already discovered some frauds and uh, we have already had some initiatives from the judiciary power in order to uh, check uh, if, uh, for example, in the management of the health uh, crisis, something wrong from some hospital, you know, that. Uh, in, in, in Northern Italy, we have a very high number of deaths and so on. So I, I see that there is a, a, a good reaction from the system in terms of uh, institutions and in terms of law and rule. The, the big risk, uh, from my point of view, comes uh, from uh, the uh, opinion for, from culture, from the public opinion, from citizens, from enterprises uh, who uh, want uh, an immediate intervention, a fast uh, answer from the government, uh, who want to speed up some procedures. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, they uh, can be some pressure in order to weaken 
some mechanism. This is, uh, I mean, reasonable in, in, in a certain uh, way, but uh, it is important to emphasize what President Kunsela uh, said. Uh, it is possible to suspend uh, some procedures in some cases that we need uh, uh, faster procedures, but we need more transparency and more monitoring in these uh, cases. Uh, so this is uh, the key. The, this is the key aspect uh, of, uh, of the system. And uh, something that I can add uh, is the dialectic uh, between uh, the central government and uh, local authorities, uh, which uh, I think that it is quite a, an issue not only for Italy, but uh, for example, also for Spain. Uh, you know that the Italian government decided to centralize uh, some, uh, some aspects uh, of the management of the crisis, for example, in terms of uh, purchasing the, the, the health uh, goods and uh, for, uh, to, to fix the, the price of the mass and so on, to centralize the management. Uh, on the other side, uh, we need a strong involvement uh, of the local regional community and also some kind of uh, uh, autonomy from that side because uh, the, 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 the pandemic, uh, of course, uh, has different impact uh, in different situations and different uh, also figures uh, of the people who are uh, in the hospitals or so on. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nicoletti. Just from my side, uh, to complete on the answer to the first question asked by uh, Ms. Agro from ANSA, just to say that we have been, we in Greco uh, Secretariat have been uh, monitoring what's happening in our member states. And I can tell you that a number of countries have already set up accountability mechanisms that are very specific to the current uh, crisis. Uh, I mentioned in France, in Germany, in the UK, and also in Sweden, work is going on to set up specific accountability mechanisms to address the risks of corruption during this particular crisis. These are good examples to look at. Now, let me move on to Lara Baena from the uh, Anti-Fraud Office of Catalonia. She has a specific question to Professor Severino. Uh, so I ask her directly the question. The question is, Ms. Severino, could you please expand a little bit on your idea about a new social contract built on trust and the impact on integrity risks uh, prevention? How do, you, how do you see the implementation of this uh, idea. So, Professor Severi, I know this is a very open-ended question, but if you can bear in mind the time, because we do have a number of other questions. Uh, very shortly. Uh, first of all, I totally agree on the fact that a new social contract has nothing to do with paternalism. And thanks, Nicoletti. Thank you, Professor Nicoletti, for underlying this aspect. Um, a new social uh, contract uh, based on, on trust uh, um, uh, has to be constructed, uh, first of all, showing the advantages of legal illicit behavior to companies and also to the public sector. Uh, I strongly underline and I strongly think that uh, illegality is not uh, an advantage because uh, before or later, uh, with our systems, which are very efficient in uh, finding uh, black money, for example, um, uh, companies will be uh, under the uh, attention, under the, 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 the attention of justice. Uh, so we have to change, completely change also our, um, our, our capacity uh, to, to consider reputation. Uh, for companies, reputation is very important. If we have to explain uh, also on the uh, communication side to the companies uh, that if they want to improve their reputation, they have to be legal. Uh, and I, I mean, when I speak legal, uh, they have to be transparent, they have to, to, um, to acquire a very good uh, organizational models. Uh, because uh, if they are able to be transparent, their reputational, their reputational level will improve and they will acquire, uh, will be able to obtain also an improvement from an economic point of view. 
If we change our mind and we are able to explain this fact, this could increase or uh, make possible to have a strong uh, social contract uh, between companies and public sector. Um, obviously, we have to monitor this capacity um, and in, on this aspect, I think it is very important uh, the uh, whistleblower uh, capacity to, uh, to, to um, uh, convince, not only convince companies, but to convince uh, uh, the, 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 the public sector uh, on the importance of this cooperation uh, between uh, public uh, uh, sector and, and private sector, between uh, citizens and uh, uh, social uh, society. Uh, whistleblower have to consider it um, as uh, um, uh, an important help for the legality. And uh, also on this side, we have to change uh, our uh, mind uh, and to consider um, whistleblower as cooperating for the uh, legal uh, framework, uh, for uh, better make the legal framework. So I think that, uh, for example, these are two pillars of uh, the construction of a new social contract. Thank you very much, Professor Severino. Very clear uh, and very, very practical uh, answer to that question. Uh, let me move to the next question that comes from Roxana Bratu from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. Um, so it's a rather long question. I'm going to read it through. Uh, you can see it on the chat as well. Uh, the question is, the COVID-19 crisis has created also a food crisis. In this context, a large number of East European seasonal workers have gone into Western European countries, in Germany and the UK, to act as vegetable or food pickers without taking the minimum health measures either in the countries of origin or in the countries of destination. While these people provide a key service for the economy of Europe, they are the least protected, and that is possible, and this is possible due to a huge power of Western agricultural associations and the lack of transparency of diplomatic agreements during this time of crisis. How can we ensure that record standards of transparency, accountability, and oversight are upheld in these cases? Who would like to take up that question? Samirja. Yeah, well, it is a question from Greco, right? So, uh, this is the question obviously related to the migration. Of course, in the question, there is a lot of facts that are basically are not related to the Greco. And this is uh, uh, things about the epidemiology measures from the uh, people who are migrating from one country to another. But in that respect, as in the other, any other respect, and this is also the next question about the upholding the standards of the Greco, the key thing is a political will, as usual, because the standards should be applied by the government or by the, by the institutions. So the, the key issue is a political will, and then, we have oversight mechanisms, which includes not only governmental, but also non-governmental uh, organizations and the, the media. And it is the same as it is in any other situation. If we came across something that is happening that it should not happen as it is, like a uh, uh, major legal reform or something like that, then we have our mechanism to trigger, which is, for instance, uh, Rule 34 or something like, you know, in, in that capacity. But in a particular thing about the migration, I think the Greco, uh, Greco recommendations are uh, for the principle of the, of the anti-corruption measures uh, uh, in the specific countries. And the migration is, I think, for my point of view, is a rule of law issue. So I think that, and of course, there is a third part, and that is the the, um, the migration stuff, you know, and this health issue. That's one thing. Another thing, there is another question, and I will just try to respond it 
quickly is about the electoral process and uh, what will happen if you know with electoral with the uh, with the voting of the people and with all the other democratic process of course if you have a quarantine in the whole country you cannot have elections right because it's very hard to 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 go to the polls and to vote if you have 20 million people who are supposed to be in your home so from the epidemiology i'm not an expert in that but from the from that point is you have to ease the restrictions that are in the countries in order to have the the the, the uh, election campaign and the elections but if you have if everything is more or less working and you still have a number of the people who are in the self-isolation or they are in the quarantine first of all there will be very few of them and the second of all these should be treated and uh, as the all the other situations where the law i think that there is a law in the, in the countries that provides how you will deal for the people who cannot go out from your home or from the hospital so basically then the you know the, the voting paper come to them what is you know i think that that is a manageable and there is a one question about the the using of the of the government friendly businesses uh for uh, for quarantine of course that's why we are uh, we are advocating transparency so that should not be happening and uh, it should be a transparent procedure about that and i'm sure that media will cover that if that happens but there is a need for the you know for the for for all those stuff uh to be uh to be monitored first of all by the politicians by themselves and then of course from internal but also external monitoring bodies and that's why transparency is all about because you know no one will give the contract for quarantine for the hotel of his brother if the media and everyone will protest to that so that's why the transparency is necessary so i think i covered uh, all those questions that are so far related to the greco thank you thank you very much uh, uh, president Birchela. just uh, for the audience uh, uh, we have uh, covered not only the question from Roxana Bratu uh, from the University of Sussex, but also uh, there was a comment by Michele Cozio uh, in relation to the experience in Spain, Catalonia, and then a question from my colleague David Orizze from Greco Secretariat, and also a question from Joseph Postgai from the uh, University of Kyoto in, uh, in Japan. Uh, but I'd like to uh, see whether either uh, Professor Severino or Professor Nicoletti would like to comment on those questions uh, or uh, add anything to the discussion. We have reached uh, noon, which was the uh, time limit for this event, uh, but I want to see if any of you three would like to say something uh, before we close the event. Would you like to say, make a final comment, Professor Severino or Professor Nicoletti? Yes, Mr. Nicoletti. Just uh, a short comment, uh, because I agree with uh, President Marcella said uh, uh, related to the question uh, transparency is a key word, a key concept uh, in order to to, to strengthen uh, our democracy in, in this difficult time. On the other side, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, to uh, defend and to protect also the role of minorities and of political opposition uh, in the parliament and in civil society, because it is true that in time of a pandemic or in time of emergency, the gathering money uh, to have a kind of advantage. And at the same time, uh, in the second phase of the pandemic, uh, when there will be a big economic crisis, I'm not so sure that this advantage 
will remain on the side of the government uh, because the difficulties will be big and big and probably we will need something different uh, from the management that we have had at this time. In any case, the Council of Europe uh, can play a very important role in monitoring uh, these conditions of uh, democracy and the rule of law in the 47 countries, the rights uh, of uh, the civil society and uh, of uh, political parties, both the, the government and the, the opposi opposition, who express their opinions and to criticize and to maintain a, a, a normal uh, democratic uh, dialogue. I think that this point of democracy is, is important. Somebody thinks that uh, just transferring the discussion in internet uh, we have the same public sphere, but the public sphere is uh, changing uh, in this uh, through this technology so this is something that we have to monitor and possibly to go back to the normality of our life uh, including uh, political and free elections i think that uh, what we are doing uh, when we go to the shops uh, or when we go to the hospital uh, respecting all uh, measures can be done also in terms of uh, our political life. And thank you very much to all of you. A very successful uh, event uh, with very good questions. Uh, and thank you for the attention and for the participation of all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Nicoletti. Professor Severino, I give you the floor. Yes, I would like very shortly answer to the Michele uh, Cozzi's uh, answer question, sorry, uh, about the Catalonia solution, because uh, it will consent me to summarize our conclusions. Uh, I think that uh, public administration has to become like a glass house, and that citizens have to give a contribution to this uh, uh, building. Uh, so, uh, not only I totally agree with the Catalonia solution, but I would suggest uh, uh, that this kind of uh, rule will be applied all over the world. Thank you for your attention, uh, thank, you for, thank you for your time, and thank you for organizing this uh, very, very important event. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Severino. Uh, President Vercela, would you like to say something before we close? Yes, you have the floor. Uh, just two sentences. First of all, I think that we basically agree on everything what is needed to do in order to prevent the corruption. And of course, I completely agree with everything what was said by Professor Nicoletti and uh, Professor Severina, uh, especially the thing about the glass house. That's it's a very, very, very good metaphor. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, but my most, most thanks goes to the participants who were uh, patient enough to listen to us for 90 minutes, which is not very easy. It's, it's much easier to, to talk than to sit and listen. So I would like to thank all of them for their patience and for participation in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Mitchell, and indeed uh, also from our side, from the uh, Council of Europe side, uh, a warm thanks uh, to all the participants. Uh, this was indeed uh, meant to be uh, an initiative by the Council of Europe Academic Network and Greco to bring together different professionals. Uh, and I think we have achieved that objective by bringing together academics, uh, the media, uh, policymakers, uh, practitioners, uh, law enforcement, national delegations in Greco, the national anti-corruption agencies. Uh, I think we have managed to uh, bring all this uh, uh, expertise together uh, to discuss uh, what indeed is a very important and topical uh, issue, uh, which is the uh, measures that uh, need to be taken to uh, uh, mitigate the risk of corruption in the context of this pandemic. This is not going to be a sprint, it is a marathon, uh, and we need to uh, uh, you know, be very careful and very patient in adopting those measures as we go along and as this uh, situation unfolds in all our member states. Hopefully, it will unfold for the better uh, as the months go by. So thank you very much uh, for connecting with us this morning. Uh, let me wish you all a good day, uh, be in good health, uh, and uh, uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.
Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.